Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. Freedom of the press, freedom of conscience, freedom to worship God according to the dictates of our own conscience and the leading and teaching of the Holy Spirit and the written Word of God, and that we don't have to kowtow to a pope. And uh, expounding on all this glorious liberty that we have, if you still perceive that we have it, or had, if you perceive that we've lost it, in this Protestant constitutional republic. Protestantism that rose out of the realization that the papacy was the biblical and historical Antichrist, that the Roman Catholic Church was the synagogue of Satan, and it was that instrument through which Lucifer, Satan, would attempt to fulfill his five-point prophecy, his false prophecy, that he would exalt his throne above the stars of God. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. Now, at the end of the program yesterday, we were continuing our discussion about this this uh, pastoral letter that Archbishop Manning, this Roman Catholic prelate, wrote expounding upon the infallibility of the Pope. First off, that the Roman Catholic Church is the one holy Roman Catholic and apostolic church. It is the one true church says says Manning, the one true church of Jesus Christ. And the head of that church is the Pope. And all infallibility of the church dwells in the breast and is dispensed from the breast of the papacy. And if the church will accept his divine right to rule the world and accept his infallibility and do as he says to do and to believe as he says to believe, then they too can be infallible. What was it Satan said to Eve? For God doth know that the day you eat of the fruit of the tree, your eyes will be opened and you will be as gods, knowing both good and evil. Isn't this what the papacy is trying to do? To make the people know both good and evil, and to be judge about what is good and what is evil, according as the Pope teaches, the biblical Antichrist, this is the thesis of this portion of the reading of this book, The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson. And I'll back up a paragraph or two for continuity. Speaking again of Archbishop Manning and his, his uh, pastoral letter dealing with the infallibility of the Pope, he says he makes it extend also to the universal practice of the Church in condemning the writings of Orthodox and condemning those, excuse me, of commending the writings of Orthodox and of condemning those of heterodox authors. Okay? The uh, Roman Catholic Church, as evidenced by their, their uh, list of forbidden books, it is the Roman Catholic Church that sets itself up in the world as the commender of orthodox writings, in other words, those writings that agree with the teachings of the Pope, and condemning those of heterodox authors, in other words, Protestant authors, those who espouse error, according to the Pope. Now, he continues, and the ethical character of propositions. Yes, he even judges the character of proposes, proposals propositions, ideas, and propositions less than heresy or erroneous propositions. Okay, he really gets into hair splitting about what is right and what is wrong in, in all manner of belief, right? 
And he says, that is, such as are scandalous, offensive, schismatic, or injurious, and more important and comprehensive than all, so that there may be no further cavile or controversy about it, this great Archbishop Manning declares that, quote, it belongs to the Roman Catholic Church alone to determine the limits of its own infallibility, unquote, which makes the whole matter rest upon the sole discretion of the Pope, so that upon whatsoever occasion or subject he shall claim to be infallible, then he is so. That's kind of like a god, right? Well, that's why they call him Antichrist. And it says there, uh, that there may be no misunderstanding upon the matter so mu of so much importance. Manning expresses the same idea elsewhere in these words, quote, The Roman Catholic Church itself, and by that he means the Pope, don't forget the Pope is the head of the Church, so wherever Bishop, Archbishop Manning is speaking about the church and lauding the church, he's actually pointing his finger at the Pope, who is the head of it. He says the Roman Catholic Church itself, in other words, the Pope, is the divine witness, the divine teacher, the divine judge of the revelation entrusted to it. There exists no other. There is no tribunal to which appeal from the Roman Catholic Church can lie. There is no coordinate witness or teacher or judge who can revise or criticize or test the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church is, the, is soul and alone in the world. Unquote. So he's got a pretty high opinion of this synagogue of Satan, doesn't he? And he's got a pretty high opinion of this biblical and historical Antichrist, the Pope, doesn't he? Now he says, by the decree of papal infallibility, it is distinctly declared that the Pope, in making definitions in regard to faith or morals, derives nothing from the consent of the church. In other words, he stands alone as authority of authorities. And he derives nothing from the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. They can't help him or hurt him. So he alone is the church. That's, that's the message in this. That the Pope derives nothing from the consent of the church. Now, t let me tell you what else this means. Bang, he's just done away with all church councils. Because remember, the infallibility that has always been believed about the Roman Catholic Church was vested both in the councils and the popes together. The trouble with that was they always had this trouble kept cropping up that the councils didn't always agree with the popes. And the popes didn't always agree with the councils. Well, the Jesuits took care of that. They're not going to have any more internal schism. They're going to put all infallibility in the breast of the pope and render the councils just like the cheerleaders for the pope. They have to assent to everything he says and agree with everything he says and propound everything he says. And they're just his rooting section now. And now that the, all the power is of the Roman Catholic Church is now vested in the breast of one man, they don't have to control the hierarchy anymore. All they have to do is control the Pope. Look, before the decree of papal infallibility, the Trojan horse of Rome had many heads. And in order to turn the, the, the horse, one must turn the head. So they put a bit in the mouth of the Pope and lopped off all the other heads. And now the Jesuits control the Roman Catholic Church. 
infallibly. <laughs> there you have it. They've consolidated power in the headship of the papacy and made the church virtually an instrument of their own design. They can move the whole Roman Catholic Church much as the Jesuit general moves each individual Jesuit priest, like a stick in the hand of an old man. Without thought or will of their own, he simply moves them about like, like uh, icons on a chessboard. And that's how he moves the papacy as well. And this is what was accomplished at the decree of infallibility of Pope Pius IX. It says, by the decree of infallibility, it is distinctly declared that the Pope, in making definition in regard to faith or morals, derives nothing from the consent of the Church as an organized body of Christians. He is the Church because all its power, all its authority, are centered in Him alone. That's right. All the power of the Roman Catholic Church dwells within the breast of the Pope. They've made him a god. And isn't that what Satan wanted to do? Make himself a god and to make man, as it were, gods, knowing both good and evil? And so at the late Lateran Council, they officially declared that the Pope is infallible and that he is the Church. Notwithstanding the Third Council of Constantinople, which anathematized the infallible Pope Honorius for heresy, and the Council of Constance, who deposed John the Twenty-Third for the most infamous crimes, and other councils have maintained the claim of the French and the Gallican Church that infallibility did not belong to the Pope alone, but to an ecumenical council and the Pope combined. This submissive body of prelates surrendered themselves to the hands of the Jesuits or Ultramontanes and conceded to the Pope alone full power to exercise the entire authority of the Roman Catholic Church in all things. Pope Pius IX made this claim of universal sovereignty on account of the dangers besetting his temporal dominion. Remember, this is the time of the French Revolution. This is the time of uh, the rise of Protestantism. This is the time when Protestantism overthrew the monarchs, the papally seated monarchs of Europe, and replaced their governments from the Pope to republic, uh, republics, constitutional republics. They were completely throwing off the temporal power of the Pope. At best, he was nothing but a spiritual leader to them. And so the Pope had lost his temporal sword. Someone had separated the silver key from the golden key on the flag, on the papal flag. the Pope received, as it were, a mortal wound. But today that wound is being healed. It's being healed by the United States of America. And R.W. Thompson is warning about it back in 1876. <coughs> Excuse me. He says, Pope Pius IX made this claim of universal sovereignty on account of the dangers besetting his temporal dominion, and the obedient cardinals and bishops shouted amen to the demand, with only a few dissenting voices which at the time were drowned in the general rejoicing and afterwards silenced into humiliating acquiescence. So it was the popular vote of the Roman Catholic hierarchy that this declaration of papal infallibility was just and true. That he was literally the representative of Jesus Christ on the earth, and the councils were just his cheering section. 
Okay, that was again 1870 at the First Vatican Council. Now, in the encyclical, Pope Pius IX's encyclical of 1864, he condemned the, quote, audacity of those persons, unquote, who ventured to insist that they had the right to withhold their, quote, assent and obedience to his decrees when they did not touch dogmas of faith and morals and declared that all such were entirely opposed to the Catholic dogma of the full power divinely given to the Roman pontiff, etc. That is to say, excuse me while I turn the page, that is to say that although the Pope shall deem it his duty to issue a decree relating to matters other than those touching faith and morals and command obedience to it, all the faithful must implicitly obey it. This was then a mere claim of authority, unsupported by the decree of any one of the many ecumenical councils which have been held in the past, and there was therefore, and was therefore, resisted by many thousands of honest Roman Catholics who thought they saw in it the establishment of the triumph of absolutism. That's right, there were some common-sense Roman Catholics who resisted this idea that when extending his infallibility beyond the scope of the teachings of faith and morals, that is, in the temporal world, that is, his infallible authority over the kings of the earth and the governments of the earth, they had the good sense to realize that he'd gone too far that this was really the erection of a global absolutism. And that's the knowledge that we need today. Now, of course, Inquisition Update denies any infallibility of any man because the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Never mind the Pope. No man is infallible. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So this arrogation of one man to the status of infallibility, a, div a uniquely divine characteristic, is the, de the defining mark of Antichrist. There can't be any other. This alone characterizes and identifies the papacy as the biblical and historical Antichrist. But there's much more evidence than just that. Now... He continues, he says, Now, it is the law of the church, that is, papal infallibility, is now the law of the church, and the voices of these thousands are hushed into the silence of a tomb. In other words, the world has accepted this idea of papal infallibility. The Roman Catholic hierarchy have accepted it. They just simply acquiesced and it has generated enough steam to silence all opposition. Though there may be plenty of opposition in the world, it has silenced it, even in the Roman Catholic world. Now, whether their silence shall ever hereafter be broken or not, all who believe in papal infallibility or accept it must be held to recognize this claim of papal supremacy in all its scope and in any uh, extent to which the Pope shall think proper to carry it. It is impossible to imagine how it can be otherwise, for if the Pope cannot err and can decide for himself what the extent of his infallibility is, then whatsoever he claims as belonging to his pontifical authority must be granted to him upon the ground that, being infallible, it is impossible for him to assert anything that is not true or to demand anything that is not consistent with the law of God. If infallibility does not go thus far, there's nothing in it at all. If it stops short of full, complete, and entire power, it is not infallibility. And so it is understood by those who are the official and authorized interpreters of its meaning. 
In the Catholic world for May of 1871, there's an ably written article reviewing Archbishop Manning's pastoral letter under the significant title, quote, The Church Accredits Herself, unquote. The argument there is that the Word of God must be true because God declares it to be so that the Roman Catholic Church is the only authority on earth commissioned by God to declare what that word is. That she, and she alone, is the witness for herself and is, quote, competent and sufficient authority for that fact, unquote. That, quote, she cannot err in declaring what God has revealed and commanded and that, therefore, she is what she affirms herself to be, or in more apt language, that the Pope affirms her to be, that the Pope affirms her to be in reference to both jurisdiction and authority. Now, that's a pretty high office for the Pope, isn't it? And the author concludes this portion of the discussion by saying, No Oriental monarch ever had more absolute power than this. That's why they call him the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And this is exactly why Lord Acton said, he's speaking specifically about this First Vatican Council of 1870, when Pope Pius IX was declared, infallible, when the papacy was declared infallible, Lord Acton responded, he said, power corrupts, but absolute power corrupts absolutely. He had it right. He is as much called the papacy antichrist. Now, many good and intelligent laymen of the Roman Catholic Church have been deluded into the belief that the Pope's infallibility is limited to questions of faith alone in the ordinary acceptance of that term. But this theory of Pope Pius IX and Archbishop Manning in the Catholic world explodes that idea entirely. It includes not only morals, but everything pertaining to the domain of morals. Everything, in fact, which the Pope himself shall declare to be embraced by it within and without that domain of faith and morals. In other words, even the natural law, as we've discussed earlier in this book, everything, every endeavor of man, every thought or idea, eventually can be traced to the area of faith or morals. And the Pope is the divine right, infallible, orator on faith and morals. Therefore, he is the divine right, infallible authority in all matters concerning mankind. Now that is raising one's throne above the stars of God, isn't it? That is making the Pope not only a priest, an infallible priest, but an infallible king. And that puts everyone, man, woman, and child, Catholic, Protestant, atheist, agnostic, whatever description, under the authority of the God in Rome. Returning to the book, immediately we have learned that Archbishop Manning is saying that you are wrong if you think the Pope's infallibility extends only over morals. No, it extends over everything pertaining to the domain of morals. Everything, in fact, which the Pope himself shall declare to be embraced by it within or without that domain. So papal infallibility extends over everything. 
And it says the church, that is the Roman Catholic Church, speaks alone through him, the Pope, having surrendered up every other mode of utterance. Consequently, if the Pope shall declare that any particular government or form of government, any constitution or law, is inconsistent with the divine law, prejudicial to the increase of faith, or to the growth or liberty of the Roman Catholic Church, the believer in infallibility is, a, is bound to regard the declaration as infallibly made, as an essential part of the faith of the Roman Catholic Church, and that belief, and that belief in it is heresy and sinful in the sight of God. If you question the Pope, you are a heretic. You are inherently sinful in the sight of God. And it says, Archbishop Manning makes this avowal substantially in these words, quote, First, that the infallibility of the church extends, as we have seen, directly to the whole matter of revealed truth and indirectly to all truths which, though not revealed, are in such contact with revelation that the deposit of faith and morals cannot be guarded, expounded, and defended without an infallible discernment of such unrevealed truths. So the Pope is even over the domain of unrevealed truths truths, not only the revealed truth, but the unrevealed. In other words, he can decide for himself what is truth. And he says, here, here it is asserted without equivocation that infallibility extends indirectly to all matters and all things which stand in the way of the progress of the Roman Catholic Church, no matter what their nature or character. The Roman Catholic Church must be guarded, its faith must be expounded, and its, ex and its supreme authority over all opposing secular power must be defended and maintained at every hazard. Whatever government or constitution or law shall impede the consummation of these ends must be resisted. Whatsoever the Pope shall direct to be done to secure their triumph must be done, because the Church accredits herself, and he is her infallible head standing in the place of God." Unquote. The Catholic world in the article referred to is somewhat more specific than Archbishop Manning in defining the indirect authority of the Pope in matters concerning morals. Seeming to foresee the ultimate point to which the doctrine of infallibility logically and necessarily leads, and not disposed to be behind others in defending it, the author of this article, with commendable frankness, says, quote, "...the principles of ethics, and therefore of politics..." as a branch of ethics, all lie in the theological order. And without theology, there is and can be no science of ethics or politics. And hence we see that both, with those who reject theology and purely, are purely empirical and without any scientific basis. So now we're getting down to the brass tacks. His domain extends over politics. And that's first and foremost the concern of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, the author strategically gives us a note at this point, and we'll read it. The Catholic World of May of 1871, volume 13, page 155. Several well-written articles have appeared in the New York Freeman's Journal, wherein the author has treated of the future of Europe. One of them, when speaking of the establishment of theocracy in the 19th century, he says that theocracy, when properly understood, should be the end of every reasonable man. In other words, every reasonable man must conclude that the only good government is a theocratic government. 
Okay? He then insists that the union of church and state, quote, does not consist in the absorption of the church by the state or of the state by the church, but in leaving each to its separate sphere with the church as the directress of conscience and the mistress of truth, not only by intervening in the affairs of state, or excuse me, not by intervening in the affairs of state, but by giving the signals. But by giving the signals. And it says, to do this, he insists that she must have liberty and that the state must receive her warnings with respect. In other words, he says, the Roman Catholic Church does not directly enter into the governments of states, for such is not her mission, but indirectly, inasmuch as political questions are connected with morals. Such is her duty, for mistress of truth, guardian of morals, she, the Roman Catholic Church, is bound to condemn evil." Unquote. In, his, in his view, all those who govern that is, all in political office, should be the lieutenants of Jesus Christ. And as society can be saved from ruin in no other way, he thinks that the future belongs to the principles of the syllabus of Pope Pius IX. It says, in commending these articles to the reader of the Freeman Journal, the editor says, quote, This is the kind of reading that men in every condition of society ought to accustom themselves to and to love. There's not a Roman Catholic man in America that is so fully instructed that he will not find a pleasure in reading this exposition. Those less read ought to seek in such writings the basis of right political appreciations. We heartily commend these papers in our journal to all our readers as sound and good reading. So the papacy is supremely and infallibly in control of politics. And it doesn't necessarily get right down into the nuts and bolts of governing. No, that's the state's job. The church just stands back and tells the state what to do by giving discernible signals to the state. And that's what takes place in Washington, D.C. Every Roman Catholic priest stands aloof as the divine orator, as the spokesman of the Pope, the divine right, infallible ruler of all kings, and the government watches for signs from those priests, and they do accordingly, out of a religious conviction. That's how politics works in the United States of America. The priests dictating by signals and signs what the government should do, what laws it should pass, little by little overthrowing the rights of this constitutional republic and replacing them little by little with Roman Catholic canon law and tyranny. Now it says, here it is emphatically announced that ethics and politics, the latter as a branch of the former, in other words, politics is a branch of ethics, and everybody know ethics is the great purview of the Roman Catholic Church, and both are within the domain embraced by the Pope's infallibility and are both under the guidance and direction of the Pope because they both lie in the theological order and because all governments not based upon theology are purely empirical. So all good government has to be based in theocracy. And the theocrat in the world is the Pope. Now, political affairs are reached indirectly inasmuch as they are not revealed, but being included in morals, which are revealed, 
a papal decree in reference to them is just as infallibly true and obligatory as if it were confined to revealed faith alone. Hence, if the Pope shall declare that any political opinions are wrong, unjust, or immoral in the sight of God, the declaration must be held by all obedient children of the Roman Catholic Church to be unerringly and indisputably true, and to save themselves from excommunication for heresy, they must make exterminating war upon all such opinions. Hence also, if he shall declare that any existing government is opposed to the welfare of the Roman Catholic Church and therefore to the law of God, the same result must follow. Exterminating war. And hence again, if he shall declare that the government of the United States is unjust, oppressive, and an act of usurpation because it gives license to the heresy of Protestantism, because it repudiates the doctrine of the divine right of kings, because it allows the people to make their own laws, because it requires the Roman Catholic hierarchy to obey the laws thus made, because it does not recognize the Roman Catholic Church religion as the only true religion, because it recognizes the right of each individual to interpret the Scriptures for himself and to entertain whatsoever religious belief his own conscience and reason shall approve, or none at all, if he shall think fit, because it has separated church and state and denies the right of the Roman Catholic Church to subordinate the state to any of its laws, because it not only tolerates but fosters and protects free thought, free speech, and a free press, and because it is on account of any and all of these in open violation of the divine law and therefore heretical, does not every man of common sense see that the papal followers must select between conformity to his opinions and excommunication, between obedience to him, that is the Pope, and the forfeiture of eternal salvation, between the resistance to the government and his pontifical curse, between treason and hierarchical denunciation, You see, they made this a matter of salvific significance. You either obey the Pope or you're damned. Every Roman Catholic, if he understands Pope Pius IX's encyclical and syllabus of error, if he understands the teaching of Archbishop Manning, if he understands the, the divine right rule of Pope and his infallibility, everything becomes a salvific issue. Now, Archbishop Manning reasons thus. He says, quote, The primacy is a personal privilege in Peter and his successors. In other words, the supremacy of the Pope cannot be shared. The, the Pope sits alone in his throne, and he does not share his throne with anyone. His primacy is personal. It's all vested in his person. And therefore, the Roman Catholic pontiff needs the help and society of no other. And therefore, also, the doctrinal authority of the Pope is personal. Again, an emphasis on the person of the Pope. He stands alone, high above the earth, high above every human institution and needs no support from anybody. And this conclusion he reaches, and the conclusion he reaches is that in order to the proper exercise of infallibility, it is the duty of the Pope to bring the whole world into, quote, unity with the Catholic faith, unquote. Now do you know what the ecumenical movement's all about? Vatican Council II was just nothing but an attempt to bring all of Christianity 
into unity with the biblical and historical Antichrist. Again, he says, the conclusion he reaches is that in order for the proper exercise of papal infallibility, it is the duty of the Pope to bring the whole world into unity with the Catholic faith, employing, of course, in the faithful discharge of his duty, whatsoever means he may deem necessary to that end. Vatican Council II was deemed necessary to that end. Upon this question, he is explicit. He quotes with approbation from the doctrines maintained by Bellarini the following propositions laid down by that author. Quote, Unity with the Roman Catholic faith is absolutely necessary, and therefore the prerogatives of absolute infallibility is to be ascribed to it. Now listen to this. And a coercive power to constrain to unity and faith in like manner is absolute. And also the infallibility and coercive power of the Roman Catholic Church itself, which is bound to adhere to the faith, are absolute. There's an absolute right being declared right here that the Pope can use force to bring the world into unity with the papacy. And this coercive force has been ex exercised all throughout history. It is the most glaring component of world history. It explains all the wars of the world, including our own. Now, Bellarini, it will be observed, placed this coercive power, which is simply the power to employ force in the church as pertaining to its plan of organization. Pope Pius IX does the same thing in the syllabus of error. But as according to the decree of infallibility, the, the Pope absorbs in himself alone all the authority of the church as a personal privilege. Archbishop Manning reconciles the apparent difficulty by declaring that this infallibility and coercive power are to be ascribed to him, that is, the Pope, and are personal, unquote. That coercive power was exercised by the Inquisition. And Archbishop Manning has simply admitted that it was a personal offense exercised by the Pope. All that responsibility for the Inquisition resides in the papacy. He says, hence we have this logical and inevitable result that when the Pope alone, without any aid from councils, cardinals, or bishops, shall decree that a resort to force is necessary to secure unity with the Catholic faith, or to get rid of anything or any government, constitution, or law which prevents or retards that unity, he acts infallibly in the place of God, and all the faithful are bound to obedience in the language of the Catholic world to unquestioning submission and obedience of the intellect and will. So if the Pope proclaims another inquisition, and this time within the shores of Protestant America, every Roman Catholic must respond and start killing the heretics. This is the coercive force of the Roman Catholic Church. It's been exercised all throughout history. It continues today, despite the denial of those who simply choose not to believe it, when in fact history leaves no room for doubt. Now, it is only by rendering this obedience that the body of the Roman Catholic Church becomes as infallible as the head. For it seems to be possessed of such diffusive qualities that it may be made to per permeate the entire membership. 
both are infallible. That is, the head and body, says Archbishop Manning, the one actively in teaching, the other personally in believing. Now, does it make sense to you why Satan said to Eve, For God doth know that the day that you eat of the fruit of this tree, your eyes will be opened, and you will know both good and evil. You will be as gods, knowing both good and evil. You will be able to judge what is good and what is evil. And the Roman Catholic Church says the Pope is the only one who can infallibly judge between good and evil. And if you want to be as a God like the Pope, then you simply blindly acquiesce, believe and do what he teaches, and you too will be as gods, knowing both good and evil. What Satan said to Eve is perfectly and completely fulfilled in the papacy and in papal infallibility. Satan has used the papacy to fulfill his false prophecy of Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15, and I'll read it again. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And he accomplished that false prophecy through the papacy. The New World Order is just Satan's attempt to fulfill his false prophecy. And here is what God says to Satan, to his human institution called the papacy, and to the world, to the Pope's new world order. Here's what God said. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. At some point, God is going to bring a short end to this new world order. And he himself is going to prove Satan to be a false prophet. Now this author says, if you want to be infallible like the Pope, you just believe and do whatever he says. Both are infallible. That is, the head and the body, says Archbishop Manning, the one actively in teaching, that is the Pope, and the other personally in believing, that is, every Roman Catholic, whether he claims to be Protestant or not. He gives the reasons because its head can never err, it as the body can never err. If the Pope cannot err, his people cannot err. And because the Pope cannot exercise an infallible office fallibly, therefore he cannot err in the selection of the means of its exercise, no matter what those means may be, whether peaceful or coercive. That's right. They will kill you in the name of God, thinking they are doing God's service because... The jihad or the crusade against the Bible believers of this world was declared by an infallible pope. And every Roman Catholic who wants to share in that infallibility will draw your blood thinking he is doing God's service. 
that's what's coming to Protestant America. Thanks for listening this week. We'll continue next week on the Inquisition Up. 